In this video, I'm gonna make this Monoprice Mini Delta even better thanks to the power of the community. When I reviewed this Monoprice Mini Delta, I found it performed quite well, with great print quality delivered at quite a pace. It wasn't perfect, however, with hard to remove prints and slow heating performance. There is more to this story, however, as other people who own this printer have suffered from a range of small but well-documented issues that I was lucky enough to avoid. Fortunately, there is an amazing community in place with a range of great resources. Let's start with the Facebook group. And I often lurk in Facebook groups when I'm reviewing a printer to see what they're like. You'll have to trust me when I say this is a good one. Everyone agrees in the community for this printer that the factory support is non-existent. So it's fortunate that we have a really good wiki. Maintained by Matthew Up, it's got pretty much everything you want to know at a glance about this printer. Next, we have the Quick Start or 101 Guide by Brian Kurtz. And this is very beginner friendly. It takes you through from your very first print it provides a free slicing profile and it has troubleshooting as well. It's got maintenance and even how to tune the tension of your belts using a guitar tuning app on your phone. Other great contents are a troubleshooting guide, including how to achieve the perfect first layer. Next up, we have the Roadmap slash FAQ by David Keaton. And instead of clashing with the other guides, it's designed to go on after you've finished with the first. It takes you through step by step on how to mod and tune your printer to get the best results possible. Everything is written with a great deal of care and is really easy to understand and follow along. Next, we have Marlin for Monoprice Mini Delta by Michael Chia. As this printer comes, the firmware is completely closed source, but Michael has managed to reverse engineer a version of Marlin completely compatible with the 32-bit processor and containing other fixes for things like slow heating behavior. Once again, there's a great step-by-step -step set of instructions and I'll be flashing this later in this video. And finally, if something breaks or goes really wrong, we have the Gidge Digi Store run by Matthew Up. It's got a range of spare parts, including main boards and even some sold with 2208 stepper motor drivers to make your printer much quieter. So what are some of these well-established problems? Well, the model by default doesn't face the front of the printer. And on the wiki, there's an illustrated guide, so you can spend only five minutes replugging in your cables to fix this problem. The Bowden coupler fitting is prone to snapping, and this completely printable solution has been created so you can print it out and avoid this problem ahead of time. Some users report that the bed is too wobbly on top of the printer, and this can ruin auto bed leveling. Fortunately, a free and printable mod has been created that can apply slight pressure and fix this problem. This is not an issue I had, so I was able to avoid this step. Despite the printer having auto bed leveling from factory, some users found that it didn't work properly and some parts of the print didn't stick as well as others. Mine worked pretty well out of the box, but after I entered an M665 Delta calibration and saved it to the EEPROM, it was simply perfect. Finally, the prints off this printer can be up to 2% out dimensionally. Fixing this is as easy as setting new steps per millimeter, which are provided once again with easy to follow instructions. So those resources will look after beginners and advanced users alike. And as an owner of this printer, I'm extremely appreciative of the time and effort that's been put in by these members of the community. Now it's time to fix the gripes that I had with my printer using these resources as well as some other products that I'd tested on other printers. By far my biggest problem with the printer when I reviewed it was how difficult it was to remove the prints. I used a special flat scalpel to get underneath and slowly pry them off, but I thought there had to be a much better way. I ordered this glass plate at the end of my review, but I found it didn't match the shape of the picture and it wouldn't fit to the printer. I was very happy to learn that Wham Bam now make a flexible build system for this printer. I was one of their original Kickstarter backers and now I fitted them to many of my printers. The kit comes with the flex steel plate, it comes with an adhesive backed PEX sheet which is like a tougher version of PEI and it comes with an adhesive backed magnet that goes onto the bottom of the printer. It also comes with a set of these shims in case your bed is not flat as well as instructions and some stickers. By far the hardest part of fitting this is removing the old build surface. I didn't heat it up or anything like that, but I found with some patience and a lot of elbow grease, I was slowly able to pry it off. 
After a final scrape and wipe down with acetone to remove any glue residue, I peeled off the backing and applied the magnet. Because it's round, it's actually easier to get in the middle. What I recommend doing is placing it down loosely and then getting something like a card to scrape outwards, get it flat and remove any potential air bubbles. I then used some IPA to degrease any fingerprints from the bed surface before applying the PEX sheet. This time I lined it up on one side and then used that same card to wipe from one side to the other, getting it flat and removing any air bubbles. Don't forget to remove the protective sheet from the top of the PEX. After a quick scrub with IPA and the supplied steel wool, we're ready to print. Now usually you need to run this PEX sheet 10 degrees hotter than your normal printing temperature, but I found that it stuck just fine. After the print was finished, removing it just needed the tiniest little flex before it came straight off without any tools. Even the skirt is easy to remove and this is such an improvement for this printer. Next up, I wanted to address the extruder and there are two problems. The first being that it likes to jam as you load filament and the second being the Bowden coupler which is prone to failure and is a non-standard part and harder to replace. I've made videos before on the Easier extruder and I had a spare one sitting in my drawer. Disassembling the standard extruder is simply a matter of getting a Phillips head screwdriver and undoing bolts until there's nothing left except the stepper motor. Just be careful to support its weight as the last bolt comes down so it doesn't smash down into the printer. As you can see, the Easier extruder lines up perfectly with the bolt holes and it comes with all its own hardware, so all you need to do to fit it is to insert four bolts. I use a piece of filament to align the drive gear and then an Allen key to tighten that. Another perk of this extruder is that it comes with a manual wheel, so now you can very easily load and unload filament when it's near the nozzle. Another thing I had spare was some Capricorn PTFE tube. So I snipped off the cable ties and unwrapped the cables and then removed the other end of the PTFE tube. Using the old tube as a template, I trimmed down a piece of Capricorn PTFE tube and as you can see, the two lengths are matched pretty much exactly. One advantage of the EZR is that it has a high quality coupler and this flexible shim to prevent the tube from working loose. I inserted the PTFE tube at the other end, making sure to push it the whole way in and seat it inside the hot end. After this, I reinstalled the cable wrap and then a printed little clip to lock in the coupler and prevent this end from working loose as well. With the cover off, you can see this is a neat install that perfectly recreates the original but with higher quality parts. Next on the agenda, the extremely slow heating. And as you can see, it struggles to get past around 54 or 55 in the pursuit of 60 degrees. The supplied 5 amp power supply is marginal for this job and you can replace it with a 10 amp model but the firmware prevents this from working as well as it should. Therefore it was time to install Marlin for Monoprice Mini Delta. One of its nicer features is better control of the heaters to get better performance even without changing the power supply. Before we upgrade we need to find out what version of the firmware we're running and it splashes up for a split second as the printer receives power. As you can see, I'm running version 44. Back on GitHub, we can see that there have been many versions with many bug fixes and feature improvements. When we come to the latest release, however, there are multiple files. This question is addressed on the wiki, and since I'm using the stock 5 amp power supply, I'm going to use the firmware underscore 5 amp limit dot binary file. And because my firmware is version 44, I'm going to use the version 43 plus version of that. The other file I need to download is the fcupdate.flg. Before we flash the firmware, it's a good idea to connect via USB with a free program like Pronterface that I'm using here, and then issue an M115 and an M503 and either take a screenshot or copy and paste all of the values down. This will give you some parameters to fall back on if you're having trouble with the new firmware, although not every parameter is a direct translation. Now these printers can be finicky with their SD card, so there's a whole page in the wiki on how to format and prepare your SD card. It's extremely important that you get this right if you want to avoid bricking your printer. One other step that would be easy to miss is to rename whatever version you downloaded back to simply firmware.bin. We can finally insert our specially prepped SD card and then power up the printer. The multifunction LED will light up and then flash for a few seconds on and off. After 5 to 10 seconds this will stop and you should notice the new version of firmware number on your LCD screen. The wiki also has a download for the required driver 
and although there's only files for Win7 and Win8, the Win8 one worked perfectly on my Windows 10 computer. With this in place, I reconnected via Pronterface, run the same M503, and changed some values such as my Z offset to match what it was before. I was delighted to see that when I changed the preheating target from 50 to 60, the temperature actually steadily climbed up. It's still not as fast as other printers, but given I haven't actually changed the power supply, it's a tremendous improvement and I'm very appreciative. One change in the new firmware is a much more exhaustive probing grid of 7x7. This takes a fair bit longer and the author doesn't actually intend for you to run it before every print, but at this stage I'm not really in a rush and it's giving me really consistent and even first layers. Updating to this firmware also fixes the steps per millimetre issue as well as the model facing the correct way without changing the wiring. So at this point I was pretty chuffed with the changes I had made to the printer but there was one niggling thing and that was the access to the LCD. Then I remembered I'd seen on the wiki a nice link to a Hackaday article with YouTube guide for moving it up the top as well as the printed part you needed to protect the back. Fitting this was fairly straightforward, you simply need to remove the screws off the top of the printer and then flip it upside down and do exactly the same thing underneath, although this time you do need to take care that you unplug the fan to avoid ripping out the cable. The front panels both have two more bolts on the left and right hand side that once removed allow the LCD as well as the blanking panel with the logo to be removed easily. The blanking panel with the logo can now be moved to the bottom of the printer where it should slot in and have all the same bolts secured in place once again. On the back of the LCD are two screws that need to come undone, the new cover placed over the top and then done up again. Once this is in place, it slots into the new top position just as it went into the lower position originally. When we insert the underside bolts to hold it in place, it seems like everything's great but there is a problem of the LCD cable no longer reaching. I added around 40 centimeters of wire to mine by splicing and soldering and then with a fair amount of effort I was able to channel this wire down with the other ones from the bottom to the top of the printer. Once everything was plugged in again I left a little bit of a loop for strain relief and then cable tied it neatly out of the way. Now it was just a matter of screwing back on the lid and the base underneath the printer and I had a beautifully ergonomic and easy to read LCD screen. Sometimes the little things can go a long way. In my opinion, this printer now has no caveats besides the limited build volume. In terms of print quality versus price, the Ender 3 is probably the only printer that I've reviewed that can challenge it. Sometimes in my videos, I've got to spend a lot of time piecing through firmware and data sheets. But the fact that it was so easy to get to this result means the real stars are the members of the community that made this possible. In my opinion, one of the things that makes 3D printing so good is the fact that it's driven by the community. It's so exciting to see the new ideas people come up with and the way they're willing to help beginners out. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.